I have done really everything wrong uh, preparing for tonight. Um, uh, the people from House of Speakeasy called me and said, will you come and you know talk? I was like, yeah, I can talk. Um, <laughs> tell a story. I was like, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I thought maybe I'll um, tell some stories about my parents. I've often talked about my parents. And um, two summers ago, my partner Madeline and I uh, moved my parents from the house that I grew up in. Um, like emptied out that house. It's a whole long thing, which I'm not actually going to talk about right now. And my dad was in and out of the hospital, moved them to a condo. A lot of things happened. I thought, I've got nothing but stories. Um, and then as I started to work on this, it ju things just, I don't know, I couldn't, I couldn't hold um, anything quite in my head. And um, so I'm, I'm going to talk to you. I'm just going to talk to you um, for 14, something under 14 minutes in uh, Three seconds. Um, and um, uh, it, the other thing, I don't know if, uh, if a anybody has uh, uh, talked about this, but the theme that we were given tonight is the, yeah, of course they have, um, uh, while the music lasts. So I, um, I was like, what? That's familiar, but what's it from? So as I'm sure some of you know, this is from a poem by T.S. Eliot called The Dry Selvages. Do you guys know this beautiful? poem. If, if, if um, you don't know it, you should read it because it's awesome. This guy, T.S. Eliot, it's amazing. You know, I, I've had this experience so many times of like, you know, there's like, there's so many things that I should have read that I haven't read. And you have this picture, right, of what a classic book is going to be. And then you read it finally, and you're like, oh my god, this book is incredible. Does anybody know about this thing? It's incredible. <laughs> so that was sort of my experience um, reading The Dry Salvages. Uh, and, 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 and it's um, uh, about, uh, I'm not gonna tell you what it's about, you know, that's, uh, there's no way to do that without being reductive, but it touches on things like the intersection of timelessness and uh, the quotidian experience of uh, daily life and, um, and uh, 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 so another, another way that I'm screwing up is we're not supposed to have notes. There's nothing but notes here. Um, and and the, uh, the past and the future conquered and, and reconciled. All these things were interesting to me because they're things that uh, playwrights uh, think about. But this particular quote, while the music lasts, the entire quote is, music heard so deeply, it's not heard at all, but we are the music while the music lasts. I learned to tell stories from my parents, who were incredible storytellers, and they had uh, very particular uh, perspectives. My dad was a German-Jewish Holocaust refugee who left Germany by himself when he was 15 years old. Um, never saw his parents again um, after that. Um, my mother is a Midwestern social activist. She was. She has um, uh, uh, all kinds of. Uh, like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue kind of thing. She's like the most uh, energetic and exhausted person you have ever uh, met. And they're incredible storytellers. And I have told many, you know, I really started telling stories because that was like the lingua franca of the family. And also because they were so incredible to tell stories about, um, you know, like, um, uh, my um, my they would they would they used to drive to New York to see my shows and they um, my my dad had become legally blind in his 70s but they were so weirdly intrepid they were both so like compromised and yet intrepid intrepid so they would drive and my mother had like this chronic fatigue thing so she would either drive she, she could stay awake a long time or no time so they would either drive like 20 minutes and then they take a nap or 14 hours straight you know and then they wouldn't stay in a motel because then that was that was too complicated so they would just pull over and put recline their seats and go to sleep and I was like you must look like a couple of corpses. Like there's two old people just like sleeping in the car. And my father would say, no, no. We put a sign in the window that says, no knocking, no waking, no burying. <laughs> so that's what he was like. And then they were always, they were so sanguine about their, you know, like my dad, my, my, you know, my mother would say things like, well, you know, so, you know, there was that thing, you know, last week your dad had that little heart attack. And I'd be like, he what? And they, they were always like dropping like little bombs like that. And then I was, I, I, my, I would say like, what is going, what are you talking? My mother would be like, look, the doctors told us that your grandmother was near death at least a hundred times and she turned out to be fine. <laughs> well, eventually she did die, but that was the exception, not the rule. <laughs> 
So I spent the first part of my life really learning to tell stories, learning how to tell stories in my family and at school and then on stage. And then I really, I realized I spent the second part of my life, I realized this today when I was struggling with this, trying to deconstruct stories and uh, trying to figure out how to make theater, which is a kind of a different thing. And a, a really key moment for me with this was when I was working on this play uh, called 2.5 Minute Ride, which was about my f relationship with my father and his history, which was in the Shiva Theater here. And um, I uh, read the diary of Anne Frank quite late in my life. Again, I was like, you guys, do you, does anybody know about this book? It's amazing. <laughs> but the thing that was so amazing to me about the diary of Anne Frank, the thing that really surprised me is that she doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know what's going to happen. And so much about the way we talk about the Holocaust is so codified now by knowing what the big picture is. But she didn't know what the big picture was. She was just this person moving through her life. And I started to realize that this was the difference between storytelling and theater. That theater takes place in a pre-narrativized reality. A storyteller tells you what happened. In a play, it takes place in what Thornton Wilder called the eternal present moment. Characters are moving forward into an unknown future. Theater, in a sense, is a container, an artistic container for the narrativeness of life. My dad died in June. Um, and he, I, I, he had a, uh, he was very beloved in, in Lansing. He was the sort of soul of the Jewish community there. You know, there was a joke that if there's one Jew on a desert island, there'll be two synagogues, so there's one he refuses to go to. Um, there are weirdly three synagogues in Lansing, and my dad was part of all of them. Somebody referred to him as the Maimonides of, of Lansing, and he was so beautifully mourned. You know, those rituals, those Jewish rituals, burial and mourning, are, you know, all, all that ritual was very, my father knew a lot about it. It meant a lot to him. And um, he, um, so he was very beautifully, beautifully mourned. Um, I saw him um, two weeks before he died. I had, um, we'd gone home. It was two weeks after the, the Tonys. And um, he, he said to me, uh, we were, we went, we saw him and he was quite weak. Uh, but it seemed like, you know, his doctors, they were going to do some stuff, and it seemed like he was going to be all right. But he, um, he said to me, uh, I, I was hugging him goodbye to go to the airport, like about to walk out the door, and he said, I made a deal with myself that I would, um, that I would stick around until the Tonys. And I said, are you going to die? And he said, how would I know? <laughs> and I said, well, you, you might know, you know. And if you do, I need you to tell me, because I'm not going to leave. And he said, no, no, you have to lead your life. And I said, I'm not, I'm not really talking about leading my life. I'm saying, if you feel that death is imminent, I want you to tell me because I won't leave. And he said, no, no, I'm fine. And, and I went. And, um, and two weeks later, he, he, he died, and, and my, my brother was with him. And at his funeral, it was really um, amazing. This thing happened at his, my father was so loved. But this thing would happen at the funeral. Literally every single person I talked to did this. I am so sorry about your father. Congratulations on the Tonys! <laughs> I realized today in struggling uh, 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 with this piece that I taught myself the craft of theater so that I could make a container that would hold the titanic love I feel for my parents, I could put it into a container that they could see and they could feel. Because I am a very emotionally contained person. And I'm also a person who's been motivated my whole life by a fear that I'm gonna regret not doing something because I'm afraid. And because I don't, I have felt this titanic love for my parents and yet been afraid of breaching that wall. What would happen? There's some way that I would dissolve if I did it. I think in some way, today I was thinking, I learned how to make theater so that I could put all of that love into that container and they could see it and they could feel it. The thing about 
uh, plays. Um, this thing about how stories look back and plays look forward. This is really what makes a play a play. This is the, the operating principle of a play. This, this thing that is the truest, plays are made by exploiting the most universal, inescapable, eternal human truth, which says that every single person, no matter how robust or clever or well-born or well-situated, not one of us knows what is going to happen next. All of us are completely innocent of the coming moment. And we go through uneventful periods where we convince ourselves that that's not true and that we do know what's coming, because we have to do that. We would go crazy if we didn't. But in the moments where things are shifting and where we can feel this shared vulnerability, this shared innocence of the coming moment, those are the moments where we feel alive. And those are also the moments where we feel connected. And what connects us is the understanding, the shared uh, understanding and experience that no matter how together we felt 10, year, 10 minutes ago, everything's changed and everything is suddenly shifting and the world is awash in loss and it's awash in possibility. And all of us are going through that together. This is the way we feel, this incandescent feeling. It's how we feel at a deathbed. It's how we feel at a birth. It's how we felt after 9-11. It's how we felt at the Olympics. You know, when we watch the Olympics, it's how we feel. It's, one might say, an experience of um, being the music. So I wrote these plays about my parents, and I poured all of this uh, feeling into it. And then um, I thought, there, there. I have done that. That is resolved. And then it turned out that there were these characters and these plays, and then there were still these people <laughs> who were my parents. And I was also still a person outside of the sort of protective uh, world of this play. And we were just moving forward. And we are still just moving forward, just flailing around in our undramatized lives. So I don't have a story for you. And Liz, dear Liz, who put this together, kept sending me these lovely emails. And um, she'd be like, just checking in to see if you want to talk about anything. And I wouldn't answer the emails, but I'd be like, fuck you, Liz, fuck you. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and I kept writing and writing and writing and writing. And the same sort of things kept coming up. And there was this image that kept coming up of my father's cheek and of touching his cheek. There was a, a lyric that was in Fun Home for a little while that the adult Allison sang describing her father and the fact that she had drawn him and drawn him and drawn him. And the lyric was mapping the swirl of his hair, the fragrant plane of his cheek, the dark blue hollows under his eyes. And you know, as Jeanine and I worked on Fun Home, we were, of course, writing Allison's story, but there was so much of our own lives that we were putting in it. And the f when my dad um, died, and we went to the funeral home, and I was um, touching his cheek with the back of my hand, the way my parents did with us when we were little. And I just kept thinking, the fragrant plane of his cheek, the fragrant plane of his cheek. And in the year before, when he had been in the hospital, I remember um, Madeline said to me, um, you need to touch him. You need to touch him. And I was touching his face. And I could see this thing happen to him. And I thought, I wonder if he's thinking about his mother. And I don't know what that means. But it means something to me. And it's not a story. It's just a thing that has some kind of meaning, that is some kind of music 
that is so deep that I, I can't hear it at all. Thank you.